Amen. All right, tonight we're in Genesis chapter number 42. We're going to be, of course, continuing the same storyline or the same plot that is with Joseph. Um, last chapter, specifically in chapter number 41, uh, we saw where Joseph was promoted to second in the kingdom. Only Pharaoh was above Joseph was one of the things we saw. Obviously, throughout the past maybe three to four chapters involving Joseph, we've seen from the very beginning the strong symbolism of Joseph representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's going to continue on in this particular chapter as well. In the last chapter also, when we saw him being promoted, we saw him uh, interpret the dreams. And at the very end, uh, we of course, let, let me explain this first. The dreams represented there was seven uh, years of famine and there were seven years of plenty. The seven years of plenty came first and then the seven years of famine afterwards. Well, here in, in uh, Genesis chapter number 42, if you remember, we're, we're going we're to be jumping into the years of famine, but if you remember, that's where Genesis 41 left off was, right when the years of famine had begun. So, there are seven years of famine, and we, we get started here in Genesis 42, verse number 1, and you're going to see that exact context. Look there at verse number 1. The Bible says this, Now when J Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look one upon another? So now I want to back up to verse number 57 of the last chapter. So you'll see this. Notice what it says. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore, it says, in all the lands. Then right there we get into 42, chapter 42, verse 1, and we can see that Jacob and his Children are all affected by this particular famine. And again, read verse number 1 with me. It says, Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, so he had heard that there was corn. That is, of course, referring to bread. I'm going to show you that again. But it says, that uh, Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look? one upon another. So he's basically saying, you know, what are you waiting for? Why are you standing here looking at each other and you know that there's corn in Egypt? You know, you need to go down to Egypt and get us corn. So they're obviously getting into a very bad situation here. Famines can be very horrible, very devastating. Of course, a lot of people die in famines and I'm sure that's what they're dealing with. You'll see that in a moment too. Look at verse number two. And he said, behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence. So that means from there, that we may live and not die. So you can see this is very serious to the point where it is questionable whether or not eventually they're going to die. They're in such a state that they could possibly die from hunger, from you know, lack of nutrition. There in uh, verse number two, one of the things that's interesting, the wording. This is very good. So if, if you don't remember all the passages where I showed you that corn equals bread in the Bible, because this can be, can be very uh, important and significant in certain cases. Uh, uh, so right here in verse number 2, we have a perfect example. If you, if you couldn't remember before the cross-references, just pay attention right now and you'll see a very easy cross-reference, a very easy proof that bread equals corn in the Bible and they're right next to one another. So once more, look at verse 2 with me. And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Now jump up to chapter 41, verse 54. Look at verse 54, the very last statement. It says, But in all the land of Egypt there was bread. So it's a super easy cross-reference. They're right next to one another. It says, you know, it's telling you in all the other lands there is no bread, but in Egypt there is bread. Then you get down to verse 2 and it tells you that there is corn in Egypt, right? So what is it referring to? Of course it is referring to bread. It's referring to, uh, you know, the, the wheat while it is still in the seed form. Uh, as I quoted last week where Jesus says, you know, uh, though a grain of wheat fall to the ground or a grain of wheat fall to the ground. He's of course talking about, or, or corn of grain, I'm sorry, fall to the ground. He is of course talking about wheat is what he's referring to. Look there in verse number 3 now. Verse number 3 it says, And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. So, ten of the twelve. So, let's see in verse number four who did not go. Look at verse number four. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest peradventure, that means like perhaps mischief 
shall befall him. Now, Benjamin has basically become Jacob's Joseph. If you remember, you know, Joseph was uh, by far Jacob's favorite son. He was adored uh, by Jacob. He was treated he was treated much better. He was, you know, he had a bias for Joseph, that's for sure. So, now what we, you can see is that basically Joseph, I'm sorry, Benjamin has now become Jacob's favorite son in place of Joseph. Now, there's probably a couple of reasons for that. Number one, Joseph is the youngest child. Joseph is the youngest child. And oftentimes, the youngest will get treated, you know, uh, uh, special, get treated better than some of the other children. Sometimes also the oldest will. Uh, but another reason is because Joseph was born of Rachel, right? So Joseph was born of Rachel. And if you remember, Jacob loved Rachel much more than he did Leah. And then, of course, the two handmaids, you know, they're not necessarily in the equation in the fight for Jacob's, you know, uh, admiration. So, uh, Jacob loved Rachel the most. You know, uh, we see that he's, he adores Joseph above all of his brethren. Joseph's gone and, and dead from the perspective of Jacob, his father. And it makes perfect sense that Joseph would now fill, fill that void. And, you know, it's interesting that he says there at the end of verse 4, he says, Lest peradventure mischief shall befall him. What do you think he's thinking of? What do you think he's thinking could possibly happen? Of course, he's thinking maybe the same thing that happened to Joseph could happen to Benjamin. So he's trying to guard uh, uh, um, Benjamin from maybe, you know, some wild beast coming and tearing him because that was what he was under the impression had taken place with Joseph. So you can see that he's trying to protect his youngest son, Benjamin, and it it looks like he's treating him the same way that he used to treat Joseph. Now that Joseph's gone, he's kind of filled that void. Look at verse number 5 now. It says, And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came. So there are multitudes of people here. Tons and tons of people from all the land. So not only was Egypt able to, was, was, this, was this able, uh, this um, plan worked well to preserve the people of Egypt, the whole nation of Egypt, all the citizens of Egypt, it's also getting them extra money because now all of these other nations are coming in and they're buying, they're purchasing uh, corn, they're purchasing grain or wheat. Uh, so now it's also even increasing, you know, the finances, if you will. It's increasing, you know, uh, uh, the dynasty in a way of the empire of Egypt that existed at that, at that time. Look at verse number six. It says, and Joseph was the governor over the land. And he it was that sold to all the people of the land. If you remember, that's what took place uh, after he interpreted the dream. He also, from God, gave inspired revelation uh, of the, the counsel that was given to Pharaoh of the fact that he should put a man over the land and officers under him and allow him to you know, regulate all of this, allow him to oversee and monitor all of this and store all of this you know, in the storehouses. And Joseph was the one that was put over over that particular project. So that's why it tells us there in verse number six, and Joseph was the governor over the land. And he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And then it says this, and Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Now there's a couple of things that I want to focus on. First, let's do this. Uh, uh, let's go back to Genesis 37. Keep your hand here, of course. Go back to Genesis chapter number 37 with me. <clears throat> You'll notice that right when, uh, um, you probably remember that when Joseph was first introduced as a character in the book of Genesis, in the Bible, you know, almost right off the bat, it got into the fact that he was able to, uh, uh, that he was having dreams that were given from God. And what his brethren were doing is they were mocking him and they were making fun of him. That was basically one of the very first things that were told about Joseph. I want you to look here in Genesis chapter number 37 with me. Look at verse number 5. Genesis chapter number 37, verse number 5. It says this, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren. So notice how this starts off. You know, speaking about Joseph and his gift that he's given from God. He dreams a dream, and what does he do? He tells it to his brethren immediately. It says, and they hated him yet the more. Verse 6, and he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. Verse 7, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. 
And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion <clears throat> over us? And it says, And they hated him yet the more for his dreams. So notice there that in this particular dream, Joseph dreams a dream, and in this dream, there are all these sheaves that are, that are gathered around. Of course, the number is to be compared unto the, the, uh, the other sons of Jacob, right? And they're all uh, 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 gathered around, and there's one sheaf in the middle that is Joseph's sheaf. And then all of his brethren's sheaves are all around Joseph's uh, sheaf. And what happens is, is all their sheaves bow down unto J uh, Joseph. We get here in Genesis chapter number 42. I want you to notice what took place there in verse number uh, 6 one more time. It says, And Joseph was the, notice this, the governor over the land. What did his brethren say? Shalt thou indeed reign over us? So notice once more, And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. <clears throat> and Joseph's brethren came, now notice this, and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Now, you'll, you'll of course, you of course notice that this is exactly what took place in that dream. And that dream was meant to symbolize what was taking place here. This was, of course, a dream that was given from God. It wasn't just some dream that he's dreaming because he's narcissistic, narcissistic and he's thinking about all these things during the day and then he dreams this dream and then goes and tells them and they're all angry with him. These were dreams that were given to him from the Lord or dreams that were given to him from God. And then he just in an honest heart went and told his brethren about it. And they just got angry with him because they were all, they already hated him. When you read the chapter, of course, you guys remember, they already hated him anyways because his father loved him more than he loved the rest. And he was given favoritism from their father. And that's one of the reasons why they hated him already. And then he's having these dreams on top of it of them worshiping him. So then they're just like, it says they hated him yet the more, right? They're just thinking like, you little prideful punk. It's not enough that dad loves you the most, right? Well, this was actually a dream that was given to, the, given to him directly from God predicting an event that was going to take place. Isn't it interesting that, they're, that they are represented by sheaves as well? And what's going on in the context of Genesis chapter number 42? I've, never, I've heard this preached on a lot, but I've never heard that pointed out. You have them coming to do what? To buy grain. What are in the sheaves? Of course, there's grain in there, right? So they're coming to buy grain, and Joseph's sheave is upright, right? You know, his sheave is dominant. They don't have any bread, right? Then what happens to them? They bow down to the ground to his sheave. Exactly what takes place here. All the brethren come. And they all bow down to him. And what are they wanting? They're wanting wheat. They're wanting, you know, sheaves basically, right? They're wanting to bring home bread or to bring home grain. There's a couple of things I want to focus right here on verse number 6 with the uh, symbolism of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6. A very famous verse. Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6. <clears throat> I mentioned to you um, <clears throat> in the end of the last chapter... Chapter number 41, we went through just a uh, just so many of the symbolisms of the last chapter of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of them uh, was a very strong symbolism of all the earth coming to, coming to the Lord Jesus Christ or coming to Joseph in that chapter and trying to buy bread. Well, Egypt represented the world. And it tells you that all the lands even came to Egypt. Well, that represents, excuse me, the millennial reign of Christ where everyone is going to come and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, with that in mind, notice there in, uh, in verse number 6 of, of chapter 42 where we were, it says, And Joseph was the governor over the land. So notice the title that Joseph is given here is governor. And we see the context, there's strong symbolism of the millennial reign of Christ and him being governor. Look here with me in Isaiah chapter number 9, verse number 6. It tells us, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then it goes on, notice government once more, verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David. 
A governor is just someone that reigns over a government. So notice here that it's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ you know, as being the ruler over the government, right? He would be a governor. He'd be obviously the top governor, right? That's what this is referring to because at the time of the millennial reign, there will be a kingdom that is set up, a government that is set up, and he will be the governor over that government. Well, here with Joseph... He is the governor over the government. So we can see here in uh, verse number 6 of chapter 42, we can see strong symbolism of Joseph being the, the one that's ruling over Egypt, over the world, if you will. Just like in the millennial reign, the Lord Jesus Christ will be ruling from Jerusalem over that government, and he will be the governor of it. Um, <clears throat> I also want to point out one other thing. Go back to, to uh, Genesis chapter number 42. I want to compare... Again, Genesis chapter number, uh, um, Genesis chapter number, oh, we went to Genesis chapter 37. I want you to go to John chapter number 1. I want you to keep another thought in your mind here. John chapter number 1. So uh, keep that in your hand. Look back. We're going to read down a couple of verses and uh, compare about four verses with John chapter number 1 and a few other verses in the New Testament. And we'll kind of uh, go through all of this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, figurative uh, uh, teachings here real quick on Joseph representing the Lord Jesus Christ in the millennial reign. Look there in verse number 7. Once you get John chapter number 1, <clears throat> look in Genesis chapter number 42, verse number 7 with me. It says, And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them. I want you to notice that. It says, And he knew them, but made himself strange unto them. And then it says, And spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? Say, saying, where are you from? Where did you come from? Whence come ye? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So notice he sees them and he recognizes them, right? But it says that he made himself strange to them. Now you have to keep in mind that quite a bit of time has went by because a lot of people ask the question like, how are they not able to recognize him? Well, when he was sold into Egypt, uh, we're actually given some numbers, right? We're given the number that he is 17 years old when Joseph is sold into slavery into Egypt. Well, um, if you remember, I pointed out the fact in the last chapter that when he stood before Pharaoh, he was 30 years old, right? He was 30 years old, and that's when, remember, Jesus Christ began his ministry. So we see that as well, right? So, so he's 30 years old, and how long, we can also do this, how long was the years of plentiness? How long did that take place? Seven years, right? So we have 17, then we go jump to 30, and then we have seven years of plenty. So we know that there's another seven years tacked on from 30 years old. So Joseph is now, at the very least, you know, let's say 38, 39 years old, right? Because a couple of years has to go by before you're just totally depleted of food 100%, right? To the point of where they're like, hey, we need to go get some bread. It may even be five years into this. It doesn't tell you exactly how long into the famine that it is. So roughly, you know, Joseph's around 40 years old. He's right under or at 40 years old. The last time they saw Joseph, he was 17 years old. Now, you could probably understand right off the bat there already why they may not be able to recognize him right away. When they see him, they're not 100% positive, hey, this is Joseph. Not only that, he looks, I'm sure he's dressed and is, and, and is taken on the culture of the Egyptians. So, you know, you see, you know, the Egyptians wear all the makeup. I don't know if that's what Joseph had on. But he looked like an Egyptian, I'm sure. I'm positive that, you know, that he, you know, uh, uh, he, he fit in into, he amalgamated into their culture and, and, and looked like an Egyptian. So, number one, you know, what would that be? Uh, uh, um, 23 years has went by, number one. And then number two, you know, he looks like an Egyptian. And it says that he made himself strange. So, he may even be trying, it sounds like he's trying to make sure that they don't know who he is. And that they're not aware of who he is and that they're, they're not aware of, you know, the fact that he is, you know, their brother. It also says afterwards that he spake roughly unto them. What does that mean? He's kind of like, he's, he's kind of verbally abusing them, right? He's being aggressive with them. He's just speaking roughly. And it's almost like when you read the conversation, it's like he's interrogating them immediately. Like it's just like guilty until proven innocent. Because he, he says to them right there, it says, And he said unto them, Whence come ye? So he's like asking them, like, where did you come from? You know, it's telling you right after it tells you that he spake roughly unto them. So he comes up to them and speaks roughly unto them and says unto them, 
You know, whence come, come ye? So he's asking them, like, where are you from? So he's almost, like I said, he's, he's interrogating them. He's already acting like, hey, you're guilty of something, right? And it says, and they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Verse number 8, and Joseph knew his brethren. And then it says this, but they knew not him. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. I want you to look there in John chapter number 1. Let me get there myself. John chapter number 1. <clears throat> John chapter number 1, keeping in mind the, uh, Joseph being a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to look at John chapter number 1, verse number 10. It says this, He was in the world, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. So it's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ saying that he's the creator of the earth. And he came into the earth. He was born and came into the world. But they didn't know who he was, right? Even though he's the creator of all of it. Now look at verse number 11. It says, he came unto his own and his own received him not. Now if you look at the relationship that Joseph had with his brethren, doesn't that sound like the relationship that Joseph had? He says he came unto his own, it says, but his own received him not. So this is his brethren that are rejecting him. Furthermore, who is it speaking about the, uh, who's rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ here? It would be the, the children of Israel, right? Well, who rejected Joseph? The children of Israel, right? The, 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 the Israelites, right? So you see a super strong parallel right there. Notice that he came unto his own and his own received him not. And then on top of that, think about verse number 10. It says, he was in the world and the world was made by him. And then it says, and the world knew him not. So saying that they don't know who he is, right? And then it jumps into verse number 11. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Now also, did his own know who he was? Did they know that specifically and were sure that he was the God of the Old Testament? No, of course, many of them just rejected him, right? And they didn't believe in the God of the Old Testament either, but they obviously didn't believe that he was the God of the Old Testament either. So did they know who the Lord Jesus Christ was? They had no idea, did they? Did they know that he was God with us? Of course, some people may, that rejected him may have had an inkling. But the, by and large, the majority did not know that God was among them and was walking among them and that the God of the Old Testament was, was there, you know, dwelling in human flesh. Of course, there were some that knew, but there were many that, that didn't know and just rejected him, right? Wasn't interested. They weren't interested in truth, right? Well, that's exactly what happened to Joseph. Joseph was there and he was among his brethren and they had no idea who he was, did they? They had no clue who he was, just like no one knew who the Lord Jesus Christ was. He was there, he was in the world, and you know, he made the world, and it says, and the world knew him not. They had no idea who he was. Go back there, furthermore, something that's very interesting, keep that in mind, <clears throat> that same uh, vein of thought. Look at verse number 8 once more, it says, And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him, but they knew not him. Sorry, but they knew not him. And verse number 9, it tells us, And Joseph dreamed, uh, remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land. Ye are come. Uh, verse number 10, And they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. Verse number 11, We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land, ye are come. Now, for whatever reason, when I actually read this passage, it, it, it for some reason points me to like the judgment, the day of judgment. One of the things keeping in mind uh, that, that, that you see here, the, you know, the, the ten brethren, right? His ten brothers, you know, being the children of Israel. And by and large, what is going to happen to the children of Israel? What's going to happen to the children of Israel? You know, the New Testament tells us that they're going to be, you know, cast into outer... It says that the children of the kingdom are going to be cast into outer darkness, right? Where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what I always envision when I read this particular passage is I picture the Israelites standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. Like you have the Israelites standing before Joseph. And who is Jesus? Jesus is the governor and he is, of course, the king of the Jews, right? He's the king of Israel. You have Joseph here being depicted as the governor, right, over 
Israel. He's as the king of Israel. And you have the brethren, you know, uh, uh, having to come to him in, in a moment of just like disparity, right? Now, what did they do before? They rejected him before, but now they're coming to him and they're desperate. And that's exactly what's going to happen to all of the, the Jews that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, today they may reject him. Today they may say, I'm not interested in, in, in Jesus. They may curse you know, and spit when they say his name and, and, and try to mock the Messiah. But there's going to be a day when they stand before him and he's the governor. There's going to be a day when they die and they have to stand before him. And guess what? He's the king. And he's actually on the throne now, right? And that's exactly the same type of situation that we see with Joseph. There was a time... It, that represents uh, uh, Jesus' first coming. Because what happened when Jesus came the first time? What? They just took him and they killed him. Right? They took him and they felt like, oh, we're stronger than him. He doesn't have any power. How did it look with Joseph? They just grabbed him up and threw him in a pit. Right? It was easy. He didn't fight back. You know, he may have tried to fight back, but there was, they couldn't have stopped it. Right? He, he died, basically. He is not, figuratively. Right? He was thrown into a pit and it pictured hell. You know, Jesus going to hell. But now, this is the second coming. Now what happens? The tables are turned, my friend. Right? And now, they're having to stand before him. And who is it? It's the children of Israel. What happened? They've rejected him. They crucified him. They killed him. But now they have to come to him and guess what? They don't have anything. What, they, they need bread. Who's the bread of life? Jesus. And guess what? They have none of it. Well, I'll tell you something very, very interesting here is when you read this passage, you look there in verse 10, it says, And they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. So it's like they're standing before him and they're saying, and he says, Hey, you know, you know, you can't get in. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking to the children of Israel. You know, you're not saved. You can't get in. What does he say? It, you know, in uh, Matthew chapter number 7, it talks about how there's going to be false prophets, right? And there's going to be those, uh, you know, many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, what are they doing? They're begging him. Lord, Lord, just like Jesus or just like Joseph being the governor. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And you skip to the end and it says, and in thy name done many wonderful works. So they're standing before him, excuse me, and they're begging him. And then he says this, this is interesting. He says, uh, they say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then shall I profess unto them, I never, what? Knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye, ye workers of iniquity. What does it say about Joseph and, and his brethren? It says that he didn't know them. Right? Or they didn't know him. Look at what it says in verse number 8. And Joseph knew his brethren. Remember, he came into the world and he knew who his brethren were, Jesus. And Joseph knew his brethren, it says, but they knew not him. Right? So that's, you know, if you put that thought together about when Jesus came to the earth, like he knew that they were his brethren. He knew who he was. They rejected him. Right? And they're standing before him now and they're trying to persuade him, but they never really knew him, did they? They, re they never really, they never really you know, put their faith in him, right? And then we get here, and what are they trying to do? Now, all of a sudden, in, the, in this moment of disparity, they're trying to beg him and say, please, just listen to me. Watch. Watch this. Verse number 11 now, or verse number 10 again. And they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food of thy servants come. Verse 12. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. That's like them saying, you know, we're true, we're true Israelites. We're one man's sons. We're of the tribe of Jacob. I mean, we're one man. It's Jacob, right? And they're just anything that they can do because isn't that what they thought is going to get them in? Isn't that what a lot of Jews even still today think? They, all, they oftentimes, you can hear them out of their own mouth, I've heard numerous times them appeal to their heritage, appeal to the fact that, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is their father. What do they say? We're one man's sons. We're Jacob's sons, right? Look at what it says next. Verse 12, and he said unto them, nay. So he just repeats the same thing. Notice how stern he is. This is how the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be on the day of judgment, right? When the Israelites come to him, those that are, are you know, one man's son, they are Jacob's children, they are the true Israelites, that's not going to matter. They already rejected him. They already crucified him. They already said, hey, now of course Jews and, and, and Israelites can be saved today, but those that reject him today still, just like those that did physically and, and, and literally at the time of Christ, they're going to be damned. And you know what? It's not going to mean anything even if they have this straight line, this pure line back to, which the, no one does, but back to Jacob. They can plead that Jacob is their father all that they want, but guess what? He's going to say, no, I never knew you. 
And they're going to say, please, please. You know what he's going to say? Nay. Nay. It doesn't matter, my friend. That does not matter. He didn't know you. He didn't know you. Look at verse 12 once again. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land, ye are come. Verse 13, And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father. That's of course Joseph. And then he says, And one is not. Now, what does it mean, is not? It means he's dead, right? And one is not. You know, so they're... They've, they've just like, they've continued. Of course, they lied to their father about it. But when there's a lie of that magnitude, obviously, you can't, you got to just keep it going, right? Now, I'm not saying that you should, but if you're going to try to get away with a lie like that, which you should not, let me clarify this to all the children and everything, too. If you're trying to get over with something like that, you'd, you wouldn't be able to, like, tell the truth to one person and then lie to someone else. Obviously, they're just like going along with this lie almost like it's reality, right? And they're just repeating it, and one is not. So they're standing before Joseph right now, and they have no idea that this is Joseph, and they're saying, yeah, the one is not. Talking about Joseph himself when he's standing there before him, right? Look at verse number 14. <clears throat> and Joseph said unto them, that is it that I spake unto you, saying, ye are spies. Isn't it interesting how adamant he's being towards them? Like he is not budging uh, with them at all. Verse 15, hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh, ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Verse 16, send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. So now he's trying to test them, basically, is, is what he's feigning to do. He's obviously, you know, faking this. Of course, Joseph knows this is his brethren. And he's saying that what he's going to do is he's going to keep, uh, there's ten of them total. He's going to keep nine of them, and he's going to let one of them go to go and get their other brother, Joe, uh, which would be Benjamin, and they're going to bring Benjamin back, and they are going to prove uh, that, you know, that they're telling the truth, that, hey, we're all of one man, and uh, we're one man's sons, and uh, we're of the land of Canaan, and here, look, this is our brother. They can tell it's their brother. So they're going to prove you know, that they're telling the truth. So, so this is the way that Joseph is going to try to test them to see if they're lying to him, right? Verse number 17. And he put them all together into ward, that's the prison, remember, three days. Verse 18, And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses. But bring your youngest brother unto me, but bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. So now he switched it up. Now he's not only going to let one go, he's going to do basically the exact opposite. He's only going to keep one. And he's going to send the other nine. Now, you know, three days went by, so he obviously thought this through. And, you know, number one, he may be worried that maybe his father and Benjamin do not have enough food to survive. That may have been one of the other reasons. And then number two, you know, he tells you right there as well. He says, for I fear God. So he may feel like, you know, that, uh, he, you know, that he shouldn't be doing this to his brethren. You never know why he's saying this. You know, it's, it's kind of, because you look at the guy, everyone in the Bible, all the Bible characters, uh, oftentimes in the Bible, and we want to like look at them through the lens of, the, of righteousness, don't we? Especially like Joseph, right? Obviously, what he's doing right now is very deceitful, number one. You know, this is deceitful. He's lying to them, is what he's doing. Um, and then he goes, he goes even farther and makes the statement, or further, he goes even further and makes the statement, for I fear God. So that's kind of, you know, that's almost blasphemous to say that I'm doing this because I fear God, when in reality he's being even more deceitful on top of being deceitful. So you can try to maybe justify it in your own mind of why he is doing this and maybe try to tie it in with that statement and make it be as if, yeah, he's doing this because he fears God. But that's kind of far-fetched. He's, he's pretty much just bullcrapping is what's going on. And he's making the statement, for I fear God, to uh, just be icing on the cake of this lie right now, of what he's saying to them. So he's going to let the nine go, 
and he's going to keep one of them. He's going to keep one of them. Look at verse number 21. It tells us this. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. Us. So that's interesting. You get a little bit more details because when you read the story of Joseph being taken by his brethren and thrown in the pit and then also sold, you don't get any of those specifics of him being, you know, him beseeching them, right? It says that he besought us. So what does that mean? That means while they were taking him and selling him into slavery, what does it mean to beseech or besought, beg? It's the exact definition. It means that Joseph was literally begging his brethren not to do this. I mean, doesn't that make it that much worse? While he's just standing there and saying, please, don't do this. And they're just like, you know, give us the money, take him, get him out of here. So, they, and so one other thing too that you can learn from this is they haven't forgot about it. They haven't forgotten about it. 23 years have went by and it's obviously still in the back of their mind because they're bringing it up and they know that it's wrong. And it's been eating at them. And they say, hey, I know why this came up. Because things that you're guilty about, if you've done something wrong and maybe you haven't, you haven't fixed it or you haven't settled it, you haven't maybe confessed the sin or gotten it right, if you commit, you know, uh, uh, or if you're punished by something, let's say something happens in your life, you'll just assume, oh, it's because I did that. Do you know why you're doing that? It's because you knew that it was wrong and you feel guilty about it. So that's what's going on here is they know when this, when this is coming upon them, like do they know 100% did God say, hey, I'm punishing you for what you did to Joseph? No, of course not. But notice they're assuming that. Why? Because they know what they did was wrong. And it's still in the back of their mind because it was terrible. It wasn't something small. It was horrible. I'm going to get into how bad it was right now. Look at verse number 22. It says, And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, do not sin against the child, and you would not hear. Therefore, it says, therefore, behold, also his blood is required. I want you to go to Exodus chapter number 21, verse number 16. Now, when do you see that statement used oftentimes? His blood is required, or the blood is required. <clears throat> it's talking about the death penalty oftentimes. It's talking about when someone has to die because they've killed someone else, right? Oftentimes, that's what it's referring to. And that's what it's, it's saying. His blood is required, saying his blood is being required for yours now. Or your blood is being required in his place. You could say it either way, right? So his blood is required, saying you have to be punished in place of his blood. I want you to look here what the punishment actually is for uh, what they did would be kidnapping, right? Look at Exodus chapter number 21, verse number 16. It says this in Exodus 21, 16. And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, watch this, he shall surely be put to death. So notice what the punishment for kidnapping or, or for uh, stealing a man. And in the New Testament, and, and I believe it's 1 Timothy, you know, it, it refers to it as, the word is actually found men stealers, right? It talks about whoremongers and it says men stealers. I think it's 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy, one of the two. It's in the first chapter of one of those epistles. So you'll see that term men stealers. What does that mean? It means just kidnappers. It's another word for a kidnapper, right? What's the punishment for kidnapping? It's the death penalty, right? It's, it's the death penalty. That is what someone deserves for taking someone, stealing that person, stealing that person's life. You're, you're, you're basically ruining their life and selling them for whatever reason. To be a slave. You know, sometimes people are sold into prostitution, whatever it may be, right? You've destroyed their life. Just like if you've killed someone, right? So, uh, in this case, it tells us very clearly in Exodus 21 that if you steal a man... Right? And the man, even if the man's not found with you, if he's found with you there, you know, because in this case he wasn't found in their hands because they had already sold him. What's going to happen? They're to be put to death. That's why Reuben makes the statement here Behold also, his blood is required. His blood is required, saying, We have to be punished for this, right? We have to be punished for, for what he has done. His blood is being required. So, on top of that, we can see that Reuben feels confident that this is a punishment that's being brought upon them for doing what? For kidnapping their brother. So we look over sometimes what they did to their brother, but, you know, that's horrific. 
Can you imagine, you know, taking your brother? I mean, it's almost ridiculous. And selling him to, like, China? You have no idea where he went. And then you, you make up this elaborate story to your parents. And you, you like, dip, you know, his, his, his garment in blood. And you bring it to your father. And you're like, you know, a wild beast tore him. And you sold him to, you know, like some other nation or some other country. That's horrible. That is super, that is extremely sinful and extremely wicked, right? So wicked that the Bible says you're to be put to death. That, you know, we can get an idea of how bad, how bad a sin is by the punishment. And that right there can tell us, you know, that it is extremely bad. What is it? It is so bad that you need to be put to death. And Reuben understands that, saying his blood's required, right? That statement's used oftentimes when someone is to be put to death for, you know, killing someone else. Look at verse number 23. It says, And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. So this is one of the ways that Joseph was making himself strange, obviously, to them. Another way where, you know, it's make, it doesn't even, they, they don't even begin to think, okay, this guy's from Canaan, or this guy is, you know, of, of, uh, of Jacob, or Abraham, Isaac, whatever. They don't think that he's Syria, anywhere related to them. He's speaking, you know, in the Egyptian tongue, and he's using an interpreter here, Right? Look at verse number 24. It says, And he turned himself about from them. It says, And wept, and returned to them again, and communed with them, and took from them Simeon, and bound him before their eyes. So, you can see that this is bothering Joseph to the core still. where He's, he's to the point where he's just about to break in front of them, and he has to leave and go away, and he cries somewhere. He's weeping, and then he comes back. Right? So, this is obviously bothering him very, very badly. You know, can you imagine not seeing your brethren after they sold you into, into slavery? You know, not seeing them for 23 years and then they come to you? I mean, that would be extremely emotional, wouldn't it? That would be extremely, you know, uh, uh, it'd be, it would, you know, there, you really can't even put it into words, right? I'm sure he has so many different emotions of, of love, of anger, of bitterness. I'm sure he's very bitter, everything that he had to go through. You know, I oftentimes thought, why did he take Simeon? You know, maybe Simeon was the one who's like, was like the leader of like, the, hey guys, he was the one that, you know, uh, uh, was maybe like coercing them into trying to do something bad more. Maybe Joseph and, and, uh, and Simeon didn't really get along when they were growing up. Or maybe he loved Simeon. You never know. Maybe he wanted to be around him and he went in there and talked to him. I'm sure there's a lot of things that happened that we're not told about, of course. You know, uh, so I oftentimes wondered like, why did Joseph actually choose Simeon? Look there at verse number 25. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. So he, number one, he says to fill their sacks with corn. So they each have a sack and he wants them to fill it up to the top. And it says this, and to restore every man's money into his sack. So the money that they were supposed to use to pay for that very corn, he wants them to put it inside of the sack. And then on top of that, it's, he says to give them, uh, it says that he wanted to give them provision for the way. What's provision? Pro to make provisions is like to prepare something, right? It's, it's preparations for the way. It's saying things that they may need to eat and drink along the way. So it says provision for the way, and it says, and thus did he unto them. Verse 26, and they laded, that means like loaded, they laded their asses with the corn, and departed thence. They left from there is what that means. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the end. Provender is what you feed to an ass. It says he espied. That means he saw his money. For behold it was in his sack's mouth. So, uh, sack's mouth, just referring to the, like the mouth of it. It'll refer to a well, the, we uh, the mouth of a well also. Just how it'll look like. It's how you, where you would uh, insert something into. Like just like you put food in your mouth. So, he says, in the sack's mouth. So, it makes it sound like to me that it's up towards the top. That makes sense because he filled, up, filled it up, then he put their money in. So it's up towards the top around the mouth of it, right around the top of it. So they filled up their sacks and right when he goes to open it up, right towards the mouth of it, the top of it, all their money is just sitting there. And he sees his money. It says he espies his money. It says, for behold, it was in his sack's mouth. Verse 28, and he said unto his brethren, my money is restored. He's saying my money has been put in here, right? It's been, been given back to me. And lo, it is even in my sack. 
and their heart failed them. What does that mean? It's talking about them being afraid. They're scared, right? And their heart failed them, and even tells you, and they were afraid, saying one to another, what is this that God hath done unto us? So why are they saying, what is this that God hath done unto us? What are they convinced of? What was Reuben saying? What were all the brethren saying? They're saying, you know, uh, Joseph's blood is required at our hands. So they are sure like God is punishing us. They are terrified that God is punishing them. And, you know, this is a proof of your salvation that God will punish you, right? The Bible talks about in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 12, verse number 6. You know, um, I just lost it. What's the first word? For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, right? You know, so, you know, the Bible teaches that God punishes his children. Just like we punish our children, you know, God punishes his children. So they think that they're being punished by God in this particular situation for what they had done, what they had done unto their brother. Look at verse number 29 now. It says, And they came unto Jacob their father, unto the land of Canaan, and told him, all that befell unto them, saying, The man who is the Lord of the land spake roughly to us, and took us, or means like considered, took us for spies of the country. And we said unto him, We are true men, we are no spies. We be twelve brethren, sons of our father. One is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me, and take food for the famine of your households, and be gone. Verse 34, And bring your youngest brother unto me. Then shall I know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men. So will I deliver you your brother, and ye shall traffic in the land. Traffic just means like to sell, right? People get you know, um, um, arrested for for dealing drugs, right? They'll, it'll be for trafficking. That's buying and selling, right? That's what that means. There's, the word traffic is used also in the book of Ezekiel. And it's in context, it's prophetic of end times Bible prophecy speaking about end times Babylon. And it talks about, you know, the city trafficking. It's saying that they're going to be selling things a lot. You look in, you know, Revelation, the book of Revelation, and what are they doing? They're buying and selling the souls of man. And it goes through like this big long list of, of all of these delicacies and, and expensive, you know, uh, uh, buildings building materials, all different type of stuff. They're trafficking, right? So he's saying that you can traffic or buy and sell in the land because that's what they want to do. They want to buy and sell in the land. Look at verse number 35. And it came to pass as they emptied their sacks that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. So before, it was just one person, one brother, when they went to go uh, open up the, the, the sack to get out provender to feed his ass, he noticed, hey, my money's in my, my sack. It was restored to me, right? And it's even in my sack. And then everybody, it says their hearts failed them, but everyone hadn't checked their sack yet. They got back and they're telling their father about what took place. And then right around that time, they all start opening up. Hey, we all got, you know, uh, uh, here's our corn that we got. And then they, they notice, oh man, our money is in every single one of our sacks. So they were scared before, right? Look at what it says next. It said, and when, and when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, it says they were afraid. Now, of course, they're scared because the guy already thinks that they're there, you know, to do something uh, negative, right? Joseph already is, from their perspective, obviously he knows they're just there to buy corn. But, uh, you know, from their perspective, they think, man, this governor of the land like, he's not being reasonable with me. That sounds like all government, right? He's not being reasonable. He's not listening to me. You know, he thinks I'm guilty, you know, and he's not giving me a chance. He's taken us and thrown us in prison. And then on top of that, you know, we, he gave us corn, and now all of our money has been put back in here. You know, what are we going to do? He's going to think, now he's going to for sure think that we stole this. You know, it'd be like, you know, it would, be, it would be, almost be like if you, like, you know, uh, tried to pay your taxes or something, and then somehow, like, the money got returned back into your bank account, you wouldn't be afraid. You'd be, you'd be scared, right? So that's basically what's going on here. You know, the money was, like, given back to them, and they were obviously the government, the Egyptian government was supposed to have this money. When they're already on thin ice, right? They, they think, you know, you know, uh, you know, we may never see Simeon again, and he's speaking roughly unto them. So they're all terrified. Um, 
because they found all of their money in their sacks. Look at verse number 36. And Jacob, their father, said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. That means like deprived. The perfect definition of that would be like deprived. Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. So he talks about how Joseph is dead, and then he says, and Simeon is not. You know, which Simeon's alive, but maybe in this case he's thinking that Simeon's going to die because we see here in a minute how he acts like he's not going back down. It says, and Simeon is not, he says, and you will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. So he's, he of course feels like there's no way out of this. He's saying every way out of this, you know, is, is against me. He's saying I just, every, you know, you know the, the, the two options that I have, they're both against me. They're both negative, right? Verse 37, And Reuben spake unto his father. Remember, Reuben's the oldest, so he's more the leader. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. <clears throat> so he says, you know, slay my two sons. Reuben obviously has two children at this time. He says, you can kill my two sons if I don't bring, you know, uh, uh, Joseph back to you, right? So it's basically his way of saying, obviously, you know, Reuben would not allow his children to die. Obviously, he would, Jacob wouldn't kill his kids, you know, but this is hypothetical. It's not meant to be serious. It's not like, oh, you know, looks like Reuben's not coming back and he gets his two grandchildren and kills them. That's not what's going on here. He's obviously, this is a hypothetical to say, hey, you know, I would let you kill my two children if I don't bring Joseph back. Now, the only reason why you would say something like that is if you knew it wasn't going to happen. So what he's saying is, I am for sure going to make sure that I bring Joseph back. That's what he's saying. He's saying that there's no way that I'm not bringing Joseph back. So he's, uh, I'm sorry, Benjamin. I keep saying Joseph in place that I've noticed that. It says, uh, verse 37, And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons if I bring him not to thee. And then he says, Deliver him into my hand. Talking about Benjamin. And I will bring him to thee again. He said, If you give him to me, I promise I'll bring him back. Verse 38, And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead. And then he watch what he says here. And he is left alone. Now, remember what I said earlier about how, you know, it's like Benjamin replaced uh, Joseph. And like Benjamin, you know, is now, you know, the, the, the one at the top, his favorite, you know, uh, son. He's the one that is, he's showing the most favoritism towards, right? So he says, Joseph is dead. And then it says, and he is left alone. Now, is that true? He is left alone? No, he's got 10 other brothers, right? So what does he mean? He is left alone. Well, it's basically like he had, you know, uh, thinking of his two favorite sons, Joseph and Benjamin. One's gone. He's like, all I have left is, you know, is Benjamin now. That's how he's wording this. It's, you can see his love, his great love. Now, why would that be? Of, of course, like I mentioned earlier, his great love for his wife, Rachel, right? He was, of course, we saw from the very beginning that he was madly, obviously, in love with Rachel. And he didn't even want to marry Leah. And you can see him treating you know, Leah lesser you know, uh, uh, than, than Rachel repeatedly throughout their, uh, uh, their lives and everything. So why is he looking at Joseph and Benjamin and adoring them? Because it's the only two children that he has from, if you consider, if, we, if you consider the only children that he has from Rachel and he, and he thinks that Joseph is dead, well, guess what? In that sense, Benjamin is left alone. Benjamin is the only one that's left from Rachel. That's obviously what he's talking about. So he says, he is left alone. It says, if mischief befall him by the way in which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now, when he says there, as I mentioned earlier, if mischief befall him by the way in which ye go, He's just saying if the same thing that happened to Joseph happens to Benjamin. That's why he's saying if mischief befall him by the way. You know, th obviously it could be in any way that he dies, but you know he's 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 picturing the, you know, that he's going to lose Benjamin the same way that he lost Joseph. That's what he's fearful about. It says, "Then shall ye bring down my gray hairs." Looks like he's an elder, right? With sorrow to the grave. Hey, I got, if anybody wants to challenge, you know, me from being an elder, right? I have quite a few gray hairs here. I can, I can pluck them all out and I can send them to somebody too just to prove that, right? You know, anybody, everybody know what the purpose why you get gray hair anyways from? Does anybody know? Do you know why you have color, you know, where, where color comes from in the human body? 
Exactly. I was going to say, I mean, you guys not been reading the comments on black Hebrew Israelite videos? Melanin is what produces color in the human body in every, every area. Your, the hair on your beard, every, every, in animals, that's where color comes from. It comes from melanin in everything. It doesn't matter what color it is, it comes from melanin. Well, melanin is uh, uh, obviously a chemical that your body produces, right? Well, when you get older, your body stops producing certain chemicals, right? Well, melanin, you know, is one of the chemicals that your body produces less and less as, as you get older. One of the things that stress can do, because you hear people say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to get gray hair early. Stress can cause your body to stop producing melanin. That's why. You've heard people say that they're stressed and they're getting melanin. That's, I said all that to say, I'm pretty sure that's why I have a few gray hairs and I'm 29 years old. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this night, dear Lord. We thank you for your word, dear God.